Hello friends, it is I once more, Rob, here at the Lair of Omnisai. Uh, new hat, but coming here a little sheepishly because I have fallen a bit behind on my State of the Dungeon address. These things are very easy to do if I just do them immediately afterwards, but things come up, and so on and so forth. I don't have any great excuses, I just got a little lazy, but I will try to catch you up to speed now. Um, because this week I have a vacation, I will not have a game, which would be the werewolf game. But I'm going to do a State of the Dungeon for the Dungeons and Dragons game, and this is going to encompass three nights worth of gameplay. It is not going to be the nuts and bolts of everything, because quite honestly my memory doesn't serve all that well. But I will do what I can. My falling off kind of started with the first week I had done a State of the Dungeon address, but I wasn't happy with it because I forgot a rather big detail in it. So I didn't print it. I was going to go back and do it again. Things happen. So, this was the State of a Dungeon address for the gaming nights of the 13th of July, the 22nd of July, and the 10th of August, where we played. So... Entering into the conversation was the party who had teamed up with a group of guards and they had plotted to destroy a group of bandits using their increased numbers and force multipliers to take out the sneaky bandits who had a manticore as artillery and had a nasty way of ambushing. So they approached the spot where the bandits were, half of the party, mostly Glug and Auric, stealthed off into the trees to try to surprise the bandits, while the rest got ready to uh, attack. However, uh, that night started with uh, several people not arriving on time. Uh, as is common with Geth, his player, because of work, frequently can't be here on time, and also because Otto the Bard wasn't here because that's kind of been his thing lately. He's getting better, I hope, but he was a, a bit absent that time. So, uh, with only two people left, Heron and uh, Glim uh, remaining, the guard sergeant and his guards showed their true colors. They were the bandits, actually. So they turned and they started attacking the party. Um... The two remainders fought as well as they could, but there were some genuinely horrible dice rolls going on. The guards had almost subdued um, Terran. Glim was trying to fight back, but when it became fairly clear to the guards they weren't having any luck pinning or grappling him, um, they just started to start hacking at him. Uh, they almost had Terran pinned, but his superior strength got him out of the situation. It also tied up most of those guards through the fight. Gl Glim was injured a few times. As a matter of fact, just as the rest of the group heard the fighting, they turned around and started coming back. And as they came out, Glim took, uh, had taken down a few of the guards, but had fallen himself. Uh, Terran was fighting like a madman against the captain and his, uh, the rest of his assorted scum. So, uh, the rest of the group pitched into the battle, and they pretty much cleaned up the rest of the fake guards, especially since Otto's player showed up, so his character was no longer swooning on the back of his horse. And finishing off these guards meant that not only had they done a service to the surrounding countryside, but now they had horses, so bonus for them. And they continued on their trek to the town of Hamlet where they were attempting to go to find a contact, a druid named Geth. So, uh, they continued along, and by virtue of a random encounter uh, from camping one of the nights in the late watch, which was Glim and Terran once more on watch, uh, they were attacked by a pair of whites led by a... Uh, a leader who was a little bit tougher than they were called the Night White, who had a white horse, which was undead. So, uh, 
Glim got a double barrel uh, attack right away uh, from one of the whites. And that went fairly well. Glim, of course, having uh, his divine powers throw up, being able to call down Sacred Flame. Um, so he had a weapon that would work against the white. On the other hand, Terran was about to join in when he was attacked by the white on the horse. And that led to a, an interesting battle. Uh, the horse did not take part into the fight until later on because it was all they could do uh, dealing with their opponents. So the rest of the group got up in the sound of combat and, and pitched in. Uh, the whites kind of got nickeled and dimed a bit. Uh, the combat was not done in just a couple of big blows. Uh, they were crafty combatants, and their powers of draining the uh, hit point cap of the level of the characters, meaning that the damage they did could not be healed until uh, full rest had been taken, uh, had them sweating a little bit. No, no lie to that. Also, the white that was on the horse was a an armor combatant. He had full armor on, which made him harder to hit. So, things went pretty tensely until the party dropped one of the knights. Then they all gang piled on the last one. Uh, the armor knight was the first one to drop, as I remember, right? Then they had to fight the horse. They realized the horse wasn't going to go down without a fight. He wasn't going to drop when his master did. And he was able to use a kind of a nasty little breath weapon of uh, the, that did uh, necrotic damage. But they ended up triumphing. And they got the suit of armor. And they got a couple other tidbits that would be useful to them. So, they continued on their journey, and eventually got to the town of Hamlet. Uh, they begged the guards to let them in, the guards looked at them, common adventurers, not a threat, they let them in, oh, if they only knew. But, they were allowed into the town. So, uh, they were introduced to the constable of the town, his name was Harleth, and Basically, they told him the story, and he thanked them for destroying the guards for them and the undead that were ravening the countryside. And uh, they, for the most part, ended up um, doing a fairly good job as far as role-playing. They into a fight with the guards. Uh, they pretty promptly went there, and then they had their choice. Because the players care, the players themselves have had characters that were in Hamlet before. They knew the various places. I didn't have to reintroduce everything to them. Um, they chose the Inn of the Welcome Wench as the place where they stayed, uh, as opposed to the Swinging Sword, which is a little bit rougher climate. Uh, they had a little money on them, so you know they could afford a little, a little bit nicer place. So that's where that night ended. We picked up again, adding a player, because the son of Glim's player, um, he, he is kind of bringing him along to the session. So he quickly made up a dwarven paladin of Klangadin called a boar. I'm sure that his father, playing a priest of Klangadin, had no influence on that decision. But he came along, and as they went into town, it turned out that... Uh, a boar, kind of a jerk, as far as um, how, how proud he is about his faith and how little he, he can stand other people. They decided that he was going to take his uh, glimpse, kind of rather racist tack, uh, looking down on others. It was a matter of extreme shock to him when he got sass-talked by a stable boy, who uh, <laughs> made several short cracks... Uh, told him that his god sounded barbaric, all kinds of fun stuff. And while he was tempted to, uh, you know, mow the, mow the tight down, reasonable heads prevailed and uh, convinced him that maybe that wasn't the best way to go. Uh, so, they went about town restocking, and they had already been set on a path to go and investigate Lance Rock, 
a place that supposedly had had some disturbances from people who had explored the near side. Lance Rock is not terribly far away from Hamlet, and the uh, constable said, yeah, if you go and you check that place out, there might be a reward in it for you. So they loaded up and they headed off for Lance Rock. Uh, there was really no encounters. The area is quite arid and plain. Of course, they're still dealing with 100 degree heat and uh, just crushing humidity. Even though the, the, the ground is dry, the air is incredibly uncomfortable. Traveling around with, with armor on of any type is a quick recipe for gathering up exhaustion levels. So for the most part, their fighter, who is working on getting his plate mail armor, he, he dealt, dealt with the armor smith to get his armor uh, tailored for him that the white had been wearing, um, decided that he's going to be carrying his armor with him instead of wearing it for comfort, which is a good idea, but, uh, you know, in random encounters, he's unarmored. He's relying on all those hit points he's got, which he again rolled disgustingly well for. He's got nearly maximum hit points, well over 50 hit points at 4th level. So, as they are, uh, they progress to Lance Rock, and they see that there is a little path that goes into a uh, crawl space underneath this big, huge, red granite, kind of an obelisk-style uh, rock just jutting out of the ground. So the fighters put their armor on, and they stroll in. And the there, they see a sign that says, uh, unless you want to fall prey to the disfiguring plague that has afflicted me, you'll turn around and leave from the Lord of Lance Rock. Well, they didn't really care about that too much. They've got a paladin now, they've got a cleric, plagues are nasty, but yeah. So they went in, and the first thing they found was a dead body in, one, in a chamber connected to the, the passageway. Uh, so... They looked at the unfortunate, and, eh, yeah, he's dead. They poked him a bit, nothing doing. Walked around him, zombie. Brrr. Well, they beat the zombie like a drum. Um, he didn't really have a chance. I mean, it's just a single zombie against a uh, not-so-well-intentioned group of adventurers. Yeah, he went down quickly. Although they did get the unfortunate fun of noted finding out that zombies, if they get hit, they have a chance of staying animated. It takes a really sizable blow or something that they're vulnerable to to take them down. Or a natural critical will, you know, take their head off. So, uh, the party finished off the zombie. Continued on. They found more zombies. Uh, they were all arranged as a jester, as a lady dancing, and I think as a bear. And the group's like, yeah, this is sick. These things are capering around. So they just attacked and mowed them down. Again, it was kind of a nasty fight because the zombies weren't dying cleanly and conveniently. But on the other hand, they weren't dishing out a great deal of damage either. My dice weren't all that hot. So they finished off the zombies. Then they found, followed along a corridor and found a room with several chests. And when they sent one person in to go in and inspect the chests, they heard taunting... But from the Lord of Lance Rock, and he caused a rock fall, the ceiling went, and nailed the person who was in the room. They found out the chests were empty. Oh, insult to injury. Now they're ready to kill the guy, as if they weren't before, but, you know. Now they know they're going against a necromancer and a guy with a bad sense of humor, so this wasn't going to end well for the Lord of Lance Rock or the party, one or the other. And sure enough, they went into another passageway and they found what looked like his lab. There were body parts and sorting bins, and there was um, a, a general workshop. There was a zombie in a cloak who kind of looked from the back like he could be the necromancer as kind of a blah, a dodge. Um, there was a row of skeletons that were kind of in an honor guard position in front of the corridor at the far end of the room. And as the party ran in and they were going to, one was going to go straight at that zone, at the, what they thought was the, the evil necromancer. The rest of them tore straight off after the skeletons, figuring that was going to be a bad thing. The necromancer himself comes forward and taunts them and then blasts them with his, his wand, which is a wand of magic missiles. And... Uh, ends up 
they end up having a magic missile uh, duel between the sorcerer, Geth, and the necromancer. Um, which is tilted slightly in the favor of the necromancer as he has shields. But uh, the party quickly runs around the, the figure that was uh, a zombie in a cloak. And before they even got to him, a bunch of crawling claws... Basically a severed hand animated by magic. If you've seen um, the Adams Family, think Thing, but lots nastier. Uh, scurried over like a spider and leapt off the table and came after the the folks who were trying to get around at the Necromancer, which was primarily Glim. And I believe Terran was caught up in that. A boar ran around the whole melee to go after the Necromancer. And... Uh, that didn't go well for him, because he ignored the skeleton bodyguards to get at the necromancer, and they dropped him. Um, so, yeah, that didn't, that didn't work out too well. Uh, Glug was nearly ineffectual through the fight. It's just kind of how he goes. Um, rarely will he take front and center. He is my GM NPC. His job is not to take front and center. Um, he's only there to cover for the weaknesses of others, and since everyone was there, there was really no weakness. Uh, Oric, however, is the one who came through and severely messed up the Necromancer. Uh, you taking full advantage as soon as somebody got there of uh, his sneak attacking uh, to finish him off. The rest of it was just beating down the zombies and crawling claws, and uh, Glim did a, a fine job of beating the crawling claws. Glug wasn't able to hit the crawling claws. He was he was having a bad night. Um, and uh, also, uh, Geth was fairly instrumental uh, going around and zapping at things. He's, his, his gun is starting to get a little bit bigger as far as magic goes. Um, he hasn't quite filled out yet, obviously. He's third now, he's fourth level, but uh, his magic missiles, he, he, he prefers for his uh, attacks to use the second level slot for magic missiles throwing out four missiles at a time. So he can do he can do some reliable damage, certainly. And of course, Terran was holding up uh, the skeletal uh, honor guard and emissaries, uh, being quite efficient again. The extra attack he gets with the butt stroke of his polearm. Uh, he's really found out that polearm mastery is a very strong uh, combination for a fighter, uh, not only taking the, the great weapon style, then coupling it with polar mastery as a skill and being able to get use his extra attack with that, yeah, it's uh, it's very strong, it's very strong indeed. And of course, with uh, being able to be a battle master, he is also able to do things like cause distractions on opponents to give the rogue uh, attacks uh, advantage. Technically, the rogue doesn't need it because if he's attacking someone somebody else is, he still gets advantage. But it's proven useful so far in making sure the enemies go down faster. So um, it's very interesting watching how that particular skill set is playing out. Throughout that whole fight through Lance Rock, that took up an entire night as the, uh, the evil necromancer Oriath and his uh, undead cronies fell left and right. And that's how we ended off the night. Then on the night of the 10th, of August, a couple nights ago, uh, we opened play at the Remnants. They had already worked towards uh, piling up the bodies and burning them, looting the place, of which there wasn't a great deal. He wasn't a very powerful necromancer. Most of the things he used, they didn't care about. So they ended up with his wad of, ma of magic missiles, which the keyword magic missile was right on the side of it. And... The one thing they, they found at the end of the, uh, the, the cavern, catacombs, um, there was his, his living chamber, which is pretty much tapestries in, a, in an irregularly shaped room, and there was a, um, a pedestal made from a bunch of severed arms that were twined together to hold up, to make, create a platform with the upturned palms, and floating above them was a crystal orb. And on it was a strange symbol, which I showed them 
uh, kind of almost an eye-like symbol with several other glyphs around the bottom. They took note of this. They also found his diary, which spoke of his growing obsession with something called the eye. And a lot of his thing was just clearly he was, he was mad. And he was getting worse until eventually his brain just fractured. He was still an effective necromancer, but you don't need a lot of sanity for that job. So armed with that, they rested because, hey, they're underground. It was cooler than going outside. And even though it was, you know, distasteful as staying in a place full of undead bodies. But uh, they cleaned out Lance Rock neatly. Um, made a pyre for the bodies. Um, took everything that wasn't nailed down or that was of any great value. And uh, headed back. So, for the most part, they got what they wanted. Wrapped up the place. Came back to town, were allowed in, and they were directed to the constable, who was like, oh, he came back, good job. He took the report. He was a little bit shocked to find out that there was a necromancer there. Uh, he was grateful that the party put him down before he created an undead army, because that's what necromancers seem to like to do. And uh, for the most part, things were peachy. You know, they were kind of like accorded as, as heroes for a bit. Uh, they had money to spend, a little bit, not a great deal. They still haven't hit the big score yet. Um, the armor for uh, Terran was almost ready, so he could slip into full plate armor when he needed to. Um, well, I shouldn't say full plate, but plate, plate armor, which is a step up from the other stuff he was had. And uh, the different party members kind of went on their way, doing things around town. This is also where idle hands would be the devil's play tool, because a boar kind of kept a grudge against that uh, stable boy in the comments that he had made. So he decided that he was going to get even. So first of all, he started stalking the kid, kind of being creepy about it. I shouldn't say kid, he was a young adult. Uh, and the, he wasn't very good at stealth, because he decided he was still going to wear his chainmail while he was doing it, and the kid heard him and went, ah, creepy dwarf coming after me. And he's like, no, I just want to talk to you. And the sailor boy's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Pulled a, a rope, hatch came down, buried the, buried the paladin in straw, and uh, he uh, relieved himself on the dwarf while he was struggling to get out of the straw. And then he ran away. Well, that kind of pushed a button. So he decided he was going to continue doing this, because he didn't have to level up. The rest of them were involved in training procedures. They all went and found different trainers, except for the people who didn't have to. That primarily was Otto the Bard, who was just shy and having enough experience to level. And, of course, uh, Abor the Paladin. So while Otto was being useful, he went around looking for rumors, trying to find out what was going on in the town. Uh, he found out that some people weren't quite acting normally, and with all the subtlety of a dump truck running you over from in front, he started interrogating people, but because he's got such amazing charisma, he's got, natural, he's got 20 charisma right now, um, he's been basically just going around saying, why are you upset? What's bothering you? To people who have, you know, secrets and motivations and things like that. For the most part, he's so good at it, they, they're just like, well, this is what's bothering me. He was able to get it out of them, despite the fact that it's the, the, the very bald-facedness of it was kind of off-putting. For your average person, if, if you're feeling down and somebody comes up and goes, why are you upset? Somebody you've never seen before. Now, you don't even know. Seems like a nice guy, but he comes up and he's like, why are you upset? Yeah, might be inclined to just tell him to go mind his own business or something. Well, he's rolling ridiculously well, so he's he's finding out some things about people, and he's learned a few things about uh, different groups that are having problems, uh, uh, strange people in robes that are hanging around out around the quarry. Um, a detail here and there. He also has a uh, serving girl at the welcome when she's a little sweet on him, so she's feeding him some things too. On the other hand, Abor is plotting the death of the stable boy. 
And so now, and then he decides he's going to hunt him. So he stalks him with his halberd, and the stable boy sees him again, and he freaks, and he turns around and starts screaming, MURDER! Apparently, that was the trigger, because then a boar took his halberd, chucked it, and skewered the kid, and killed him. Uh, he's very strong, and he rolled maximum damage for his halberd. He hit him even though he had disadvantage, throwing a weapon that's clearly not designed to be thrown, but it was at close enough range as he turned around to run, killed him. And there's where a dose of silly comes in. Whatever wisdom his character has, he wasn't playing it. He took the body and uh, tried to hide it under some hay, despite the fact that I clearly said the kid screamed murder. So as he's in the act, the door opens and there are some guards. Well, he's got blood all over him from moving the body and trying to bury it, trying to stuff the body under a hay pile. The guards are like, okay, you're coming with us. And he wisely didn't decide to try to kill all the guards. So he went with them, expl trying to explain himself the whole way. So he gets thrown into jail. Word gets back to the party that their paladin is in jail. And the party's response, we don't even know the guy. The cleric, his dad, uh, the player, said, um, you know... Gee, that's, that's, that's awful. That's too bad. Nobody told him to do it. He did it on his own, and, you know, that's part of role-playing. Including the consequences in a realistic world. So, the next day, the constable goes up and he's like, what did you do? He's like, he insulted my god. So I killed him. He's like, you know, just for a single insult, killing somebody isn't the way. That's what the followers of evil gods do. Your God's supposed to be kind of honorable. You just did this because you wanted to do it. And he's like, well, I'm going to have to have a magistrate come in, and he's going to hear your case and decide if we're going to hang you or not. Yeah, okay. At this point, uh, I don't think the player completely bought into the game yet or the character and didn't seem to care if his character lived or died. He felt he got his pound of flesh, even though it was going to cost him his whole body. And... Uh, the rest of the group was just like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. I, I think every single one of them expected me to have his character just hung out of hand, which certainly might have been appropriate. But again, you're on the border of civilization. He was an orphan, known for being a smart mouth, and he picked the fight with the wrong person. So there's some extenuating circumstances. In addition, he's only an orphan. He doesn't leave behind any family or anything. And from the pragmatic point of view of the uh, the law, yeah, there's some extenuating. He he had you know he was legitimately there. He had helped kill the necromancer and all the undead. Um, not exactly a hero yet, but you know he seemed to mean well up till this point. So it was kind of a crime of passion. That's how they ruled on it. So the constable reserved judgment. So they had to wait in town for a few things anyhow. They had to wait for the armor to be ready for Terran. They had to finish off their training. And again, Otto didn't have, or uh, Otto and um, Abor didn't have any training. Otto, I think, tried to help, but it didn't go well. I think that was one of the few times he rolled like a two. What happened for everything else was that, again, Logan... Uh, sorry, the player who was playing a boar was rolling really badly that night. Lots of twos, lots of low rolls. So, the magistrate comes in, and the magistrate was this big, very big man. And he came in, and he interviewed, first of all, the constable, and he's like, okay, tell me about this dwarf. And he made it quite clear that, you know, the dwarves have their own society, we have ours. When dwarves feel they can come into our society and act this way... We can, we can hang them. And then the rest of the group is like, ooh, that's not good. The constable's like, well, he's a paladin, so supposedly he's a holy warrior. He did help against the necromancer, and so far, you know, this group seems to be good. They've killed bandits and stuff, and they're vouching for him. I don't think the group really vouched for him all that much, but the cleric of, of Clagadid was like, yeah, please don't kill him. So the magistrate actually talked to the party. 
to show that he's not just some pompous figure. You know, he's he actually wants to do well by everybody. And he's like, okay, have you seen him do this kind of thing before? And they're like, no, this is totally out of character for him. And you think he's he's safe to have the community? Yes, he's a pal. You know, he's he just saw something that was that was unacceptable there, but he he learned control. So then the magistrate, I use this as a good role-playing experience rather than a combative experience or a time to roll dice, lots of dice. I, we, we rolled almost no dice through this encounter. The magistrate went to a board, and he's like, so, you killed. Yes. What do you feel about that? You know, I, I feel bad about that. I shouldn't have done it. Do you, do you feel that what you did was necessary? No, I didn't. It was all on me. I'll never do it again. I feel terrible. And uh, after a bit of grilling and stuff, he's like, all right, I'm ready to pass judgment. Uh, you took a life, and even though he was an orphan, he was a value to the people who were employing him, the work that he did, and all the lives that he may have touched in the future. I understand that he uh, perhaps antagonized you a bit, but that's no excuse in a lawful society to allow people to just kill for an insult. So this is what will happen. You will have to provide to the state for your crime 300 gold pieces. In addition to that, you must provide 50 gold pieces to the stable owner for the labor that he is out. I'm certain that he'll find someone else, but you have inconvenienced him and you owe him for that. He's out all the experience and all the training that that lad had. 50 gold pieces is a lot of money in this time period. And all told, the group has totally probably found about maybe 500 gold combined in their adventures. To my belief, it's my belief. I haven't looked it up, but it hasn't been a great deal. 300 is a lot. And he had to provide the 300 to the magistrate before he'd be allowed to go free. Well, the group scraped together everything they could sell, uh, the, the, the stuff that hadn't been divided up out of the party yet, uh, all the 130 gold that the paladin himself had, of course, was forfeit, but now the party got pitched together and they came up with the money to get him free. So, yeah, he was, he was able to walk free and clear after that and wiped out most of the party's resources. So grabbing extra healing potions or maybe upgrading some, eh, they just aren't able to do that. So the party got some good leads. Uh, they talked to some important NPCs around Hamlet, made some bonds, got some inroads going. The bard started weaseling his way into society, which is good. It's a good thing for a bard to do. Brought them some, uh, some legends and lore around town. And then they left town afterwards to prepare to go off to Scarlet Moon Hall, where the druid contact that they'd made, who seems fond of shape-shifting, uh, told them that uh, there's a sect of druids, an ancient sect that's being re reincarnated, that are trying to solve the wonky weather problems. And they're so far behind that, because every single one of them is tired of me describing how hot and miserable it is. Uh, and just how the weather is completely messed up. So they leave town. And uh, the way they're going is into the Badlands to the west, or to the east of Hamlet. So as they're going along through, they're going through an area where there's very high bluffs on either side of the trail, leaving them kind of a corridor of stone with no roof to travel along. And they go to a certain point, and nobody really makes the, or has the high enough perception. Uh, I asked all of them to uh, choose their tasks, as is outlined in 5th edition, as they're traveling. A few, one of them, I believe, is, is leading the group, the one with a better survival check. The rest of them are either foraging or uh, looking around to see where they're going. They have a map, so they don't have to have a map maker specifically, but... They are still, you know, keeping their bearings and such. And the ones who were perceiving did not roll high enough to see the stone methods that were on the cliffside as they were going along that were planning an ambush. So as they're going along, all of a sudden there's this big rock slide that comes down. And two of their number get buried, Terran and I believe a boar, 
get buried up to their waists in this rock and take some damage. So the rest of the group, some of them move up to help. The rest of them go up and look and see what caused the rock slide. Out of them, Orc is the only one who sees them. He's very perceptive. He is their dwarven rogue. His, his perception is quite good. So he sees these little two-foot-tall humanoid rock-colored beings up there. And not even very good look at them because they're very hard to spot. So he points up and he fires his bow. And at this point, Geth is the only one who hasn't moved in or isn't pinned, so he fires off a uh, chill touch or something on them. So the, uh, the rest of them are like, oh, wait, maybe we shouldn't be helping them, maybe we should be dealing with this. But so many of the group are melee combatants. It pretty much became clear that their choice, the, the things were 60 feet up, they had to go over and start trying to climb the bluff. Well, these methods were generating stones that they were throwing and pelting them. There were a total of four. So the party was getting peppered um, pretty savagely, too. Um, their dexterity was pretty good, so the base damage for the rocks they were throwing may not have been that high, but that sting that their higher dexterity was giving was, was significant. So the party is getting peppered and getting tired of it. The rest of the group is, is getting dug out, um, which pretty much leaves Glug to start trying to climb up. Otto decides he's going to try to climb up. Now becomes a huge comedy of errors. Every single person who tried to climb up at one point or another failed their climb check. The difficulty was 10. Many of them are not trained in athletics, and that's, you know, therefore a somewhat difficult number for somebody who has a, you know, average strength. Climbing up a cliff face free is not terribly easy. There is certain, you know, a certain danger to it, especially when you've got methods pelting down rocks and such. So the people who should have been really good at it, like Oric, yeah, that didn't go so well. <laughs> but Oric has a ring of feather falling which he reminded me of, which allowed him to float down. Otto didn't. Otto the Bard failed like three or four rolls in a row. Badly. Rolling twos. Meaning he was making stone angels. Uh, he did some serious mischief to himself and was coughing out blood by the time that the paladin got out and wanted to go over and try to heal him. Um, the paladin healed himself, and then he healed Terran from the damage they took in the rock slide, and then they started getting pinged by rocks from above. Geth decided he was tired of getting pinged by the rocks, so he cast one of his new second-level spells, Crown of Madness, which is a nasty little spell, as it turns out. Firstly, it charms an opponent, which is a nice thing, you know, a charming opponent. But then it also makes it so that if he gets close enough to another living creature... The target snaps and goes psycho on them and starts attacking them. And it even leaves a cool, twisted crown of iron on their head as a physical reminder. It's like a total package spell. Now, if they make their save, there's no ill effects or anything like that. So if you're an all-or-nothing type caster, eh. But if you hit with it, and you're able to take that opponent and, and maneuver them into the range of their friends, yeah, it can become a lot of fun. So, and again, madness. So even if they're their friends, it's not like charm where they'll just, hey, dude, he's cool, don't hurt him. They're not going to whip out their weapon and attack with a basic charm. The crown of madness, they'll attack whoever is closest. Unfortunately for the party, Glug got up there just as his little psychopath uh, got to that corner. He did get the advantage of chucking off one of the methods down to the ground, though, uh, which destroyed it. The rest of the group is trying to fire back and uh, attack the, the other three methods, uh, now down to two uh, that were attacking, and they just weren't doing a great deal of damage. Number one, these methods, because of an elemental charm, uh, were resistant to attacks made from metal or stone. So wood, and magic, elemental attacks, those were all able, able to do full damage. Everybody else was not, just not doing very much. It was like the metal was just sliding off. So Glug gets up there, and this little guy starts going after him, and he butts him with his little antlers, little horns that he's got on his head. 
Glug rolled a natural 20, picked him up, and whew, chucked him off the cliff. And even with resistance, psh, he shattered. The rest of the group got up, and it kind of started then becoming what it often is with the group. When they've got a small number of opponents who can't really run away, it's just a, a, a brutal uh, pinata battle. Um, by the time uh, Taryn and, and company got up there, it was pretty much over. Between Orc getting up there, Glug getting up there, um, I think even Otto finally... No, I don't think Otto got a rapier shot in at all. Um, but uh, with the damage that Geth did, and uh, Orc with his bow managed to score some hits, yeah, uh, all told they, they diced up the methods. Uh, it was a tough fight. One run, one did run away. It had the ability to meld into stone. Uh, there's, they have a few different abilities than what you'd find in the book, but uh, there was a reason for it. I've been making some changes to a couple of things through the stated adventure, and it's been working out pretty well. Uh, the group had a hard fight, knew they were in a fight, did, took more damage than I actually expected them to. Um, I didn't realize how many of them were really limited to melee attacks. And on top of that, uh, the rock slide that they hit with caught more than I thought. I thought maybe they might pin one person, but two people failing. That slowed them down, especially since they were mainline fighters. And also, 60 feet up and, and 10 feet away, you, they were out of range for the 60-foot range spells. So it was only the longer range spells that would really work, which I thought would really work into... Uh, Geth's favor, but uh, it turned out that he had more fun just mind-controlling one and then using his action to continually suggest that the creature continue to move to attack his his enemies. At one point, he blew a uh, a roll to, because they don't speak the same language, he blew a roll to try to get him to go over to his friends, and he wasted around just... Ah! Blah, 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 blah. Such fun. So that was three sessions of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition in one State of the Dungeon address. I apologize, this has gone too long, and my absence was... Well, I'm sure you missed me. But uh, I hope this makes it up to you. It is a little long, but it is as complete as memory serves, and contains a lot of the highlights and lowlights of the group. So, I am Rob. The Lair of Omnisai. This is my State of the Dungeon Address. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have safe adventures.